Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is Central European University. My name is Andrea Vaghi. This is a webinar today because this week uh, is a, a CU virtual open class week. Um, and uh, during this event, we wanted to offer an opportunity to prospective students um, and interested parties to um, get a, um, an idea of uh, what teaching is like at CEU and what are the topics that, uh, that are discussed in the classrooms. Uh, today's event is specifically dedicated to quantitative social sciences. This is a new bachelor's program that CEU is going to um, launch in this coming September. And because we don't have classes yet, we decided to um, uh, offer you a webinar uh, where we will talk about uh, topics that uh, um, relate to quantitative social sciences, this um, very exciting combination of disciplines. Um, before we, we start, I would like to make um, a short housekeeping announcement. So this event is uh, currently streamed live on Facebook. So I would like to ask everybody who's with us and watching to uh, make sure to turn their cameras off if they don't, don't want to be on the live, in the live event and also to turn their microphones off, but um, to feel free and write us questions in the chat box be, be, because after the, uh, the presentations are over, which is gonna take about 30 minutes, um, we'll, be, we'll, take, we'll, we'll, we'll be taking questions and we'll, we'll try to answer them. So um, let me give it over to Tiago Peixoto, um, the head of the Being Quantitative Social Sciences program. Tiago. Thank you very much, Andrea. So welcome everyone. So as Andrea has mentioned, uh, this, is, uh, in, this webinar is intended to give a sample of, of the topics that uh, are, are relevant for the, our new program in Quantitative Social Science or, or QSS for short. Uh, the main distinctive feature of this program, of this undergraduate program, is that we, we, we want to mix uh, mathematics, computation, and statistics, just like you would have in a hard science undergraduate course, like physics or, or computer science or mathematics, together with uh, the soft or qualitative aspects of social sciences, right? We're talking about sociology, uh, economics, environmental science, political science, and so on. The idea is then to combine this in a single undergraduate program so that we can tackle problems in society that require these two, these two aspects, which is in fact a lot of them. So today we're going to have, be having um, Martin Karshai and Yula Koltai who are both uh, faculty at the Department of Network and Data Science at the Central European University. And they are just a, a good example of the mix that we are attempting to do with QSS. So Martin is by training a physicist, but he works with, with, so, with networks and social systems. And Yula Koltai is a sociologist and who also works with networks. Uh, and they belong to the same department. They also be going to be teaching at the QSS uh, program. Uh, and they'll be talking about, so the title of the presentation is uh, what does big data tell us about the spread of COVID in Hungary, right? It was an excellent example of research in quantitative social sciences. So without further ado, I'd like to give uh, the camera over to, the microphone over to Marto and Julia. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tiago. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen, hopefully. Successfully. Do you see my slides? I assume yes. All right. So, as Tiago said, I'm an associate professor at the Department of Network and Data Science. And uh, just a few words about my scientific interest. I'm working on computational human dynamics or in larger in human dynamics, uh, making uh, analyzing large data sets about uh, social interactions, mobility of people, um, and also build uh, quantitative models for um, their understanding what kind of mechanisms are leading human behavior and uh, what kind of predictions we can make about them. And um, in this talk today, I'm going to talk, I'm going to present um, an ongoing study 
where we both, Yuli and me, are involved. Actually, we are running this large data collection uh, effort uh, to learn about how behavioral changes are induced or are happening during the COVID-19 pandemic. But before I get there, just a few words in advance about why is it so important to understand uh, behavioral changes uh, for the modeling of a pandemic is actually because, um, well, the population of, on the globe has increased enormously over the, over the last decades. And um, all these large density of people are, are more like a fuel for the pathogens because um, many diseases like the actual COVID-19 um, uh, disease is, is actually transmitted uh, between people through social interactions. And since they are mixing um, at different scales, for example, when they travel in a city or when they are traveling between continents, they can bring the disease all around and can pass it to each other. This leads actually to the second very important point, why networks are uh, um, central in the understanding of pathogen um, uh, spreading is, well, as I said, um, Social interactions are, or proxy of people, are one way, or the most important way, how these diseases are actually transmitted between people. And um, well, this is actually determined how people are geographically collocated, how they are mixing to each other, how uh, many in contacts they have day by day, uh, face to face uh, with each other. So there are two kinds of network picture that can be used for the modeling. One which describes these interaction patterns of people, and the other how which describes the mobility pattern of people, how they move in space and they, how they mix at different locations. So to understanding how social networks and human mobility influence epidemic is very, very crucial. And actually this is providing the base for most of the modern um, pandemic models, but it is used by experts all around the world. Um, on the other hand, of course, the question is, how can we do that? How can we um, know how people move in space and how can we know that people actually interact with, how they interact with each other? And the big data revolution or the digital revolution, which was inducing this paradigm shift in uh, computational epidemiology, because several data sets became available, which describes this kind of um, um, behavioral patterns. One can, um, uh, for example, use data sets which describe face-to-face -face interactions. Here I show you a very small example where using uh, RFID technology, face-to-face -face interactions recorded in a school, uh, recording actually how uh, children are talking to each other, facing each other during the day uh, within the class or between classes. But you can also think about online social networks, which give us a good proxy of, of uh, international social, inter uh, social ties or social contacts. Um, actually drawing the large picture all around the world, how countries are connected locally, but also between each other. One can also think about mobility maps. This is actually a mobility map which, which comes from Hungary, uh, from a call detailed record mobile phone data set, which describes on a, on a typical day how people are moving between different cities uh, all around the country. Further, um, we have, of course, data coming um, about the epidemic itself. I can mention, for example, pathogen, pathogen data, which describes how the different variants or mutants are um, appearing as a function of time and distributed all around the, all around the world, uh, which could actually help um, immunologists and epidemiologists to identify where the disease is coming from. Further, we can use um, large-scale transport, air transportation networks to see not only how people move in space, but for example, what are the consequences of the different restrictions uh, which has been applied by different governments. Here on this, on this short video, what you see is um, um, how flights were actually uh, uh, flying over Europe on a typical April day uh, in 2019, so before the pandemic, and on the very same day or a similar day in 2020. And you see that radically, the number of flights radically decreased due to the lockdown, which was actually in place in order to reduce uh, the spread of the pandemic in Europe. Finally, we can use um, like classic population data 
coming usually from census, which describes locally the distribution of people, for example, in a given city, in terms of their income, in terms of their working condition, and so on and so forth. So all in all, using all these types of data, our main goal is to start from um, some initial condition what we could measure about the pandemic, like, for example, the number of infected cases per day or the number of uh, deaths per day, and arrive to epidemic models, which um, provide a similar uh, resolution in terms of prediction, what we already have for um, meteorological systems, for example, to predict uh, in case of a hurricane is approaching the coast um, of, of the United States, for example, where it is going to land, how strong it is going to be, uh, what, is, what its trajectory is going to take. So our goal is to actually design models which can predict epidemics or pandemic outcomes with the same resolution, with the same details, uh, or with the same certainty what we already do for uh, meteorological systems. Um, so we, we recognized this problem in the very beginning uh, of the pandemic in Hungary, and we, we, we started to build models, and soon we realized that the we are lacking some very crucial part uh, or piece of data sets, which describes how people are mixing together um, on a given day um, in the country. And in order to obtain this data, we designed um, um, a data collection campaign, what we called MOSC, which is the Hungarian uh, data provider uh, questionnaire. Uh, you can also fill it in if you feel like uh, it's unfortunately in Hungarian. Uh, so unless you speak Hungarian, it might be difficult. And the main purpose of this question was to um, ask people from day to day about their contact patterns, how many people they interacted with on the day before and also before the pandemic. Um, the, the huge uh, advantage of this data collection is that, uh, first of all, it's anonymous, so we don't know anything about the, the respondent. Uh, we are not collecting any uh, personal information. It is a rolling data co collection, so we can carry out. Actually, it is on since the 23rd of March, and it is ongoing um, even today. So there are hundreds of people coming back every day uh, to fill uh, this question about their previous day. It is dynamical, so we can have um, a picture about the contact patterns day by day. It is relatively cheap if I compare to traditional data collection methods, like, for example, phone surveys. And the whole purpose is to estimate age contact matrices, which is um, telling us that on average, on a given day, a person who is between 20 and 30 age old, how many other people he or she interacted with from an age group between 60 and 70, for example. So this, this piece of information is very important because uh, providing this to epidemic models, we will actually uh, make a better uh, uh, assumption about how people are mixed together and uh, with what probability uh, actually um, the infection can spread from, from one age group to another um, on a given day. Um, at the same time, the question also allows us to follow behavioral patterns and, and actually sampling the opinion of people um, about uh, actual topics like vaccination or anti-vaccination or the trust um, in, the, in the restrictions uh, and policy makers and so on and so forth. Um, this question became actually a, a huge success. Um, since the 23rd of March, we have over 260,000 respondents. Uh, which is over 2.3% of the Hungarian population. And uh, we have over 420,000 um, um, responses, um, which, is, which is quite large. Actually, this grew one of the largest, if not the largest, data collection effort to estimate contact matrices. The um, questionnaire takes different parts. Um, when you come and fill, in the first, you will be asked about your demographic details, your age, gender, occupation, or even the structure of your family. Then there will be a few questions about your mobility abroad and also mobility between cities on your previous days. And then the questionnaire is um, separated into two parts. One is asking about your behavioral pattern, like, for example, your contact patterns on a typical weekday or on a typical weekend uh, before the pandemic, so before the 23rd of March 2019. 
13th of March 2019. And the other part of the data set is asking about your, your previous day. So how many people um, you have met uh, yesterday who were between um, uh, five and 14 years old, for example. And then the met, so means that the, the social connection definition is also uh, diversified. We are interested in your proxy connections, so to speak, how many people you have spent more than 15 minutes within two meters, and also about your physical connections, so how many people you physically touched uh, without any protection the day before. Um, here you see a typical snapshot. It's a snapshot about the contact matrix, how we collect this. You see that these are radio buttons. You can just click to estimate the number of people you met from different age groups. So using this large data set um, of 420,000 records, uh, we could actually look at different um, behavioral patterns or behavior uh, changes during the pandemic. First thing we can look is how people move between cities. Uh, during the during the during the observed period, and um, although it is a very sparse data set because of course we don't have the full population answering this question, we could already see a radical difference between the 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 before and the during the lockdown period um, of the pandemic. We see that before the lockdown, the the mobility patterns were were very, very well connected and the region, many different cities and you see a hierarchical structure uh, connecting large cities to smaller ones and large cities together. While during the lockdown, these structures, so to speak, disappeared or fall apart and uh, because people were restricted to stay at home and they could travel just for essential reasons. Further, we, we looked at how actually respondents were distributed in the country and we realized that um, well, it is very uh, uneven, so to speak, that the Western part of the, of the country, people living there were way more active to answer the question than the South, East or the Eastern part of the country. Further, if we look at the different uh, categories, for example, demographic categories in terms of age, employment status, education, settlement type or, or gender, we realize that the people who actually answer in this questionnaire are not very representative, actually they're not representative at all about the Hungarian population. Most of our respondents were, were middle-aged ladies uh, with uh, living in a larger city, um, having a university diploma. And um, this was actually highlighting one of the weakest points, which was never addressed before uh, in studies like this, that uh, this online questionnaire is cheap and dynamic, but is very unrepresentative. In order to make it better and make it closer to, represent, to a representative sample, we decided to collect another data set where um, every month we are um, asking 1,500 people from the country selected in a representative fashion uh, to answer the same question. So now we have two questionnaires or two data sets. One is collecting a representative sample about people and then once per month, and the other is collecting a day by day, very large uh, data set about a non representative sample. And uh, at the same time, we also have the census data coming from the Census Bureau. And the, through the combination of these three data sets, we can actually reweight or reweight re the online data set that it becomes way more closer to a representative sample based on the census and the representative telephone survey. So after we reweight these um, um, uh, contact patterns and we reweight our data, we could actually draw up, um, for example, uh, to follow how the average number of contacts were changing over time during the pandemic. This is the bottom figure. You see that um, before the pandemic, on average, a person had about 25, 26 social relationships, proxy social relationships. And all of a sudden, uh, in March, this dropped to the value around three, around three and two and a half and three, there was an increase of ninety percent due to the due to the awareness of people and mostly also because of the policies, the restrictions what the government was introducing in the country. And as you see, you can follow the different periods of the restrictions over time. You see the the first um, release of the lockdown uh, appeared. Um, was indicated by a sudden increase of the number of contacts. And uh, this was actually going on over the summer. In September, when the schools were again open, uh, you had 
again, a large increase in the, in the contact numbers. And then when the second wave arrived to Hungary, people started to uh, decrease their social, uh, uh, social number of social ties. Um, and actually, it really, it released, uh, it, it arrived back to the point that we have about the same number of social ties what we had in March during the first lockdown, um, because there is, a, there is a curfew in Hungary and also because people are very aware of the danger of uh, not keeping distance from each other. At the same time, we could actually estimate the, 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 the age contact matrix, which describes this probability that people from different age group interact with each other in a dynamical fashion. On the top, I draw you the results which come from the representative survey. But what is more interesting on the in this little video on the right hand side, I show you the, the day by day um, uh, uh, matrix, what we measured after reweighting. Um, so make it more representative uh, from the online pattern. And this is a, a very high um, importance, a very value, valuable data set for the epidemic modeling. Um, what we actually also do with a, with a mathematical modeling team uh, from the University of Szeged. So very well, this is um, all I wanted to say. Uh, just a few words about my collaborators. As I said, um, Julia Colte is, uh, is the other person, researcher who is, who is uh, uh, collecting this data together uh, with me and, um, and, and a little team. Uh, in our team, there are two other researchers. They are both, uh, Orsha is from, uh, from, um, from the Central European University. Uh, she is actually now postdoc in Warwick, and Esther Bokányi, who is at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. So um, due to all these people with the help of, with all these people, we succeeded to, to set up the system, to collect the system. And, and you see that in terms of, um, if, you, if you look through a computational social science um, um, glass, it may appear that this is a large interdisciplinary project where by using technology or methodology borrowed from computer science, mathematics, and physics, we are trying to make an observation about the large social systems, how behavioral patterns are changing during the pandemic in Hungary. Uh, this is all I wanted to say, and I would like to give the word to Yuli, who is going to, to continue to talk about the same project, uh, uh, talking about the different aspects and conclusions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin. So I also share my screen. So welcome, everyone. I would like to continue where Martin uh, finished it. So um, I will talk a little bit more about, because Martin described the type of data collection and the goal of the data collection very clearly. And now I would a little bit like to talk about the social aspects of these, um, because basically I'm a sociologist and a statistician by training. Um, I have a PhD in sociology, but in the latest years, I, I mean, based on my works, um, I mostly call myself computational social sciences. So what I would like to talk about now is how we can understand uh, how vaccination attitudes uh, affects um, the way how we decide about social distancing and about the number of people who we have contacts. So that's more about the understanding. Why is it important to understand uh, how do these concepts um, relate to each other. It's very important because if we understand the deeper social underlying social processes um, uh, of how people decide about their number of contacts they have during this pandemic period can really help us, first of all, of course, in the targeting communication of different measures and uh, how we should um, how we should communicate the new governmental restriction, which helps the flattening the curve, for example. But also on the other hand, of course, it helps us to make better predicting models. And um, we can separate basically um, the factors which can affect the number of contacts we usually have on an average weekday to two parts. The first is a kind of a strong constraint, I would say, because you know, if you have a job that doesn't allow uh, to be in home office, then for sure you don't have the opportunity to reduce your number of contacts. So we can talk about a kind of dimensions which we usually call a sociologist social 
demographic dimensions like your age, your job type, or uh, your gender, for example, or the type of settlement where you live. So these are hard constraints. Um, and interestingly, in the models we have, we can we we saw that um, that these kind of these kind of factors do not really affect the number of contacts. So we cannot really explain why do people have different number of contacts with each other um, if we only focus on the so-called socio-demographic characteristics of the people. So, but then the question is that what are the characteristics or what are the attitudes and the values which affect how we decide about our um, social, um, social interactions? So that's what um, this little presentation will focus on. And as Martin said, we have the online dynamical large scale data collection um, with the online questionnaire, but at the same time, because it's not a representative sample, um, we are taking representative cross-sectional studies in each month from the uh, beginning of April 2020. It's a smaller scale data collection um, but it is very useful for us because actually we can add uh, questions according to current issues which are arising in each month. Um, this is a so-called CATI data collection, which, uh, which is an abbreviation for computer assisted telephone interviewing. So um, they are making this data collection uh, from, uh, um, from a phone call center. Um, and right now, because actually the telephone penetration is almost 100% in Hungary, they can definitely reach almost everyone they want and thus create a representative sample of the whole country's population. Um, we asked 1000 people in February, between February 19 and 25. So what you can see is really the latest data uh, from the last week's data collection. So it's quite current. And actually you will be the first one who will hear about this because these are really the latest modeling results. So um, as I've told you, it was hard to us because we couldn't really explain uh, the number of contacts and we couldn't, couldn't really detect those dimensions which can affect the, uh, the number of contacts. We couldn't explain much of the variation uh, of the number of contacts between people of the whole country. So that's why we wanted to go to a kind of more soft, more value-based, more attitude-based direction. And um, then we added items to the questionnaire uh, which were related uh, to the attitudes toward the vaccination. And, uh, and these were you know, quite extreme attitudes because we were interested at who are the people who are kind of anti-vaxxers in these days in Hungary. I mean, um, from all the researches, we definitely know that around 25% of the whole population, of the whole adult population in Hungary, uh, we can call anti-vaxxers, which basically means that they definitely do not want to vaccinate themselves with any of the offered vaccines. Um, so we wanted to understand this phenomena, and thus we added 16 uh, statements into the questionnaire and we asked the respondents to evaluate these statements that you can that you can see here on this slide. Um, they could evaluate the statement on a one to five scale where one meant doesn't agree with the statement at all and five meant that the respondent completely agrees with the statement. Um, so you can see um, the items are sorted uh, based on the uh, last values, so according to completely agree. And uh, you can see, for example, that 34% of the whole population uh, agrees or completely agrees with the statement that no one can know what does the vaccine include. Um, also, uh, around the same percentage agrees that the vaccine was created in too short a time. So that's a kind of trust issue. Um, they also think, I mean, 25%, so basically the quarter of the population think that um, they, whoever are the they, they withhold the dangers of vaccination. Um, they also think that uh, corruption and the lack of transparency characterize the vaccination uh, practices with around the same percentage and that virus statistics are safe. So you can see that there is really a kind of trust issue uh, according to the vaccination which can affect the way how people, um, people develop their attitudes towards the virus. Um, you can see anyway that uh, uh, four percentage of the population even agrees with the statement that chip will be implemented, implanted to the people uh, by the vaccine. 
And also around the same percentage, even a little bit more, a percentage of the people believe that Chinese and Russian vaccines will be relabeled to make them look Western ones. So um, we have a couple of issues in this country. According to vaccination, I mean, we are not alone with that because of course, sure, I mean, other countries struggle with the same kind of beliefs. But what we could do is that we wanted to separate the different way of thinking uh, behind the agreement of these uh, statements. So we created something which we call a confirmatory factor analysis. And it sounds very complicated, but actually you can see based on the result that it's not. So what we did was that we separated these statements, we separated these items and checked if they create a kind of latent dimensions. What, do, what is this latent dimensions that sociologists love to create? Latent dimension is something which is a kind of concept in, in people's head that they cannot explicitly formulate but based on their agreement of different statements or based on their behavior uh, we can conclude to these kind of values and these kind of unconscious concepts so what we did was to separate these concepts and um, we separated three different concepts behind these questions um, the first was the kind of conspiracy theory um, way of thinking. You can see that the items which belong to this dimension was the chip will be implanted to the people by the vaccine. The goal of vaccination is to achieve complete control over humans. The vaccination intentionally infects people with the coronavirus. So you can see that these kind of items are strongly related to conspiracy theories. The second dimension we could separate was that um, was a kind of the lack of trust, okay, the lack of trust, which is basically um, built up from the statement that no one can know what the what uh, does the vaccine include, that they withhold the dangers of the vaccination, virus statistics are fake, and that corruption and the lack of transparency characterize the vaccination practices. So these are the four items from which we could build up a latent dimension, an unconscious concept, which is about the lack of the trust in the vaccination process. And the last dimension we could detect was um, that how, uh, how people uh, fear from the virus. Do they fear from the virus? So there were two items which were sounded the following way. The coronavirus is just an inflated flu and there is no virus, so there is no reason to vaccinate. And so these items, these two items built up a kind of latent dimension that we labeled the no fear from the virus. So I question, our question was that how do these vaccination attitudes affect uh, the number of contacts people have with each other? As I've already told you, for sure, there are social constraints. Um, basically, those are dimensions of inequalities, uh, which can affect how people can influence the number of contacts they have with other people. Because, for example, a shopkeeper, you know, uh, just cannot just cannot solve not to meet people and not to interact with people. I mean, even the physical interactions. Uh, and also, for example, medical doctors are in the same situation. So for sure, there are constraints. But our problem was that when we built up those models, which focused on these socio-demographic characteristics like gender, the type of settlement where the respondent lives, education level, age, income, or the size of household, they didn't really give us um, strong explanatory models. So we could explain some part of the variation in the number of contacts of the people, but not that much. So that's why we went to more to another direction, which was more about attitudes and values. But as I've told you, because it's really important how these social uh, characteristics um, makes the constraint, makes the strong constraint around the number of contacts, we controlled for them in the whole model. So that's why you can see them on the left side, because it's important that these, um, these results that I will uh, just show you uh, are all valid if we control for the gender, the settlement, the education, the age, the income, and the size of households of the people. So the model we tested was the following. Uh, we built in the three um, three concepts, the three separated dimensions of 
attitudes towards vaccination into the model. And we wanted to explain how the number of contacts are changing among people. But for sure, we believe that these kind of attitudes towards vaccination uh, do not arise from the nowhere. These are not from scratch, you know. And uh, so we included two other dimensions into the model, which we found important based on earlier researches. And the first item uh, that you can see here is that uh, how people see how they can influence their own life. And the second dimension we built in was that if they generally think they can trust in people or if they feel that they cannot trust them. So these are the two items that we all included. You can, you can see these paths. Um, this model is called structural equation model that you can see here, which again sounds complicating, but it can give really good insights for more complex social processes. So the paths are kind of um, stochastical, effects. Uh, sometimes we say causality. It's not really proper from a scientific point of view because these are not causal models. But I mean, we assume that there are effects. So for example, if you can see a, an arrow between trust in people and, uh, and for example, conspiracy theories, it means that we believe that the level how people trust in other people can affect the likelihood that they believe in conspiracy theories. So let me show you the results of the model. Um, these are numbers. These numbers. Um, these numbers are basically comparable. So um, um, numbers in absolute values, which are larger, uh, denotes larger effect between the two between the two concepts. Um, but I strongly suggest you now to only focus. Uh, uh, only focus uh, on the direction, which basically means that if you can see a negative sign here, then it means that those people who believe more in conspiracy theories, they have less number of contacts. Okay, if you see a positive sign, it means that basically, if you don't fear from the virus, you will have more number of contacts. So that's what you should focus on I mean, most of the time. And so let me show you one by one what we found. You can first of all see, as I've told you, that those people who believe in conspiracy theories more, they reduce their number of contacts. However, those people who have no trust in the vaccine and those people who have no fear from the virus, they have more contacts than the average Hungarian person in the sample. So let's focus on the details of this uh, um, on the details of this uh, model, and let's start the analysis with the trust in people because we found really interesting results. So what can we see here? We can see that those those people who trust in other people, they are less likely to not to trust the vaccine. So basically they are more likely to trust the vaccine. However, those people who trust in the vaccine are less likely to have the number of contacts, okay? Again, if those people uh, who trust in other people are less likely not to fear from the uh, uh, virus, so they, are less so they are more likely to fear from the virus, and actually, those who fear from the virus are less likely uh, to have large number of contacts. From a mathematical point of view, what you can do is you, you just multiply these so-called coefficients of these parties, of these arrows. And so you can see that high trust in people can lead to lower number of contacts through the fear from the virus. And those people who trust in other people are uh, more likely to have less number of contacts because if you multiply these two numbers, you will get a negative number. Um, so also if, if it goes together with the trust in the vaccine. At the same time, what can we again see? So those people who trust in other people are less likely to have conspiracy theories, but those who are less likely to believe in conspiracy theories, then basically they would have more number of contacts. So if you multiply these two numbers, what you can see here that you will get a positive number because these are two negative numbers originally. So what does it mean? How we can conclude that? Because, you know, it sounds a little bit contradicting. We can say that if um, trust 
in people goes to if the lack of trust in people goes together uh, with no trust in the vaccine um, basically it means that they um, they can increase their number of contacts they don't trust people um, they don't trust in the vaccine so um, they will um, they will increase their contacts and it's the same with the no fear from the virus however the trust in people goes together with conspiracy theory uh, actually it can decrease the number of contacts let's just go on and the focus also in the influence of own life you can see that actually it was not significant so the influence on someone's life uh, do not affect the fear from the virus but anyway we can see the same patterns as we saw in the case of trust in people in the case of conspiracy theories and no trust in the vaccine so all together, what I really wanted to demonstrate with this, that quantitative social science program is really about mathematical, um, mathematic based modeling, I would say. But these very complex mathematical models can lead us to the really deeper understanding of social processes, which are crucial um, if, we would, if we would like to understand uh, the society around us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia, and thank you, Martin. Um, so uh, this is the end of the, pre the two presentations that we prepared for you today. Uh, I'm constantly looking at the chat box to see whether anyone has any questions. We also have a few uh, people joining us through the Facebook Live event, um, and they can. They are also. It's also possible for them to post um, questions on Facebook. Um, uh, so right now there are no questions. Uh, we have about um, 15 minutes left. There's um, one question in the chat box. I can see. Um, uh, so Susan is asking, uh, this question is for Yulia. Um, uh, she says, I think I might, might have lost some, some during the, the presentation. I'm curious where the, the respondents mainly come from and may these data um, be biased. She was uh, surprised by the large amount of uh, conspiracy theory people. Um, so Yulia, would you like to take this? Sure, absolutely. So, um, so this is a smaller scale one, but this is a representative one, which basically means that it is based on random dialing and the ratio of landline and mobile phone numbers um, are, um, are the same as the population of ratio of these. And so after checking the initial data uh, based on the basic socio-demographic characteristics and compared it with the census ratios, we could see that, that the data seems really representative, not only based on the sampling strategy, how they, do, uh, how they collected the data, but also based on the uh, characteristics of the sample. So it is a nation nationally representative sample, which includes basically every strata of the Hungarian society. And yes, we are also a little bit surprised by the large amount of conspiracy theory believers. Thank you. Um, while we are waiting for the next question, um, I just wanted to ask a question from both of you. Um, so we heard um, in the uh, in the beginning that um, uh, one of you is a sociologist, the other one comes from the other side of the, uh, the QSS uh, disciplines. Um, so in your career dealing with network science and data science and combining um, social sciences and, and uh, the quantitative skills, how, do you, how did you um, catch up on the other side? of it, or um, we talked about uh, this topic with uh, Tiago earlier in a, in a webinar um, where he said that so far, the majority of the, the people who work on, on research and studies like this typically have one or the other background and then they somehow slowly catch up or quickly, depending on the circumstances on the other side of it. So can you say a few words about your training or your experience with the other side? Yes, um, maybe I can start this. Um, so it, 
I'm a physicist by training and I have um, a habilitation in computer science, but I'm working on studying social systems since over 10 years. And um, my motivation to go in this direction was because I really wanted to understand how human mobility or human dynamic works or what kind of mechanisms you can find over there. And if I think about my educational background, I, I bring the view, point of view as a physicist. So I'm looking for, for laws, if any exists, or, or, or things what one can generalize. Um, on the other hand, if I would like to address this type of system, social systems, I had to learn and read a lot to catch up um, about the concepts and hypotheses and theories uh, which are actually describing, the, which has been described over the last two, three hundred years about social behavior. So um, it has to be self-motivated. And of course, uh, I learned it uh, in a very expensive way by myself, um, the other side, so to speak. I don't like this kind of um, separation, but let's call it the other side. And on the other hand, of course, if there would be any program uh, like the QSS, would, would be an enormous help. When I was studying at the university, I was in a, in, a, in a hybrid program like QSS, but that was between computer science and physics. I'm a computational physicist by training. And um, I see all the, the advantages of this because that actually opened my, my, my point of view uh, for interdisciplinary research, where you can actually combine methodologies uh, to answer questions, even from other disciplines where your training is landing. So um, I think it's very important to have programs like this. Thank you. Julia? Yes, so as I've told you, I'm a sociologist by training, but I also have a, a statistician diploma. So um, I would say that the basics of mathematical understanding I already had after my graduation. But um, when I definitely started to develop my computational tools was, uh, was my PhD project where I was working on um, um, social uh, justice and social inequality questions, but from a quantitative point of view. And, you know, I got to a point when I realized that, okay, I have a really interesting theoretical question, but I don't have the mathematical tool to answer that. So I, again, the same, I started to develop myself <laughs> and started to get to learn new models. I went to summer schools and I uh, went to special trainings to different countries where I could learn about new techniques because I you know I really didn't want to reduce the complexity of my theories I just wanted to find the more complex mathematical models to be able to answer them so that's how it developed for me and then after um, uh, after uh, defending my dissertation um, I, I you know of course I use social media as most of us do and so I really started to um, uh, focus on okay so this you see, I mean, I can see a lot of patterns when I'm reading my Facebook wall. So, so it would be amazing to somehow collect data from that because I'm sure that if I collect not only, you know, my friends' comments and my friends' likes and uh, reactions, then it would be really interesting to see how people uh, behave on this virtual space. And I'm sure, as, and I was absolutely sure that, that, I mean, we could really ask new questions and we could really understand the society from a different perspective if we could have access to this data. So, um, so during my PhD, I've told you that I've learned several computational tools, which basically means like, I don't know, one programming language and two uh, statistical softwares um, I got to learn how to use. And then I started to learn another programming language after my PhD, just to be able to work on social media data because I was really interested in that. Um, so this was a kind of organic way how we did, but I can I can just join to what to what Martin said that um, that actually we had to learn it by our own, and it was it was a bit hard, and you really had to be very self motivated uh, to get until this point. And I think it is just a great opportunity that now it is all collected in one program in one training. It is all offered from all sides, from the theoretical, from the computational, from the practical. So I can, yeah, I mean, uh, I definitely suggest everyone who is interested on in this field just to try this program because I think it will be awesome. Thank you. Oh, we received a, a question and I think it's, um, it's very um, 
Um, it would be great if Tiago could react to that. Have, have you seen a, another question from Susan? I will read it out just so, so everybody can hear. Um, so she wants to ask about the career development and the core competitiveness of the QSS program. Besides, if someone decides to go to continue with graduate education, what can they further study after receiving the QSS bachelor's degree? And then I will react to the second part of the question. Okay, so yes, yeah, so these are uh, good questions. So the uh, the program is divided in such a way. There's a, 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 the the student. Uh, there's some sort of core um, modules where you learn uh, mathematics, statistics, and several uh, branches of, branches of the social sciences. And then you go into a specialization. So you get to choose two of, of five specialization tracks. So we're talking about uh, social sociology, economics political science, uh, environmental science, and data science. So you choose two of those and you do uh, pro pro uh, two projects based on this and also potentially uh, you can do, you can do a, you know, work in a company for, for, for example, so this is possible. Now, this gives you a lot of options for, for graduate, graduate education. So you can go into each of these fields if you'd like. You can also go into programs that exist for, for graduate school, which are interdisciplinary. There are more of those, right? There are more programs out there at the graduate level that combines these different fields, in particular, there are many about computational social science. In fact, we are going to, uh, we are planning to, to, to introduce a master's program in computational social science, which will be very, uh, very good for our QSS students, we, pre we predict. So this, there's this option as well. So there are plenty of options, in certainly in graduate school, uh, to go further, right? It's the undergraduate uh, field, I would say, that is more underrepresented in this, inter in this inter interdisciplinary intersection, which we are at, uh, attacking, so to speak, with with a QSS. But there are, pl there are more options, right? Of course, we, there are even more, but there are more options about for graduate education. So there's plenty of plenty of, plenty of things to do. I, so just, just say, so the, you mentioned, you saw some uh, opinions about Marton and Yulia, and this is something that we have often encountered when presenting this program to researchers, people who, who are in graduate school, uh, who went beyond graduate school to do a, a profession in, uh, in, in science and, and research. Uh, and this is often that they say, well, I wish this course was there when I was doing it, right? When I was doing my undergraduate studies. I, I, we've heard this opinion many times. And I think this does reflect the usefulness of a course such as this uh, to do it for graduate education as well. Thank you, Tiago. Um, there is a um, second part of uh, Susan's question. She's asking what happens uh, from September. Is it possible or will it be possible for international, international students to go to school on campus um, under the current um, pandemic? Um, well, it's a good question. <laughs> we, you know, as, as you have seen the past one year, it's really difficult to predict exactly what will happen. Um, the campus of CU is in, is in Vienna. Undergraduate programs are being taught um, and the QSS will be taught in Vienna as well. We are complying with the Austrian laws and regulations regarding um, you know, whether there can be any in-person teaching. What I can tell you is that CU is very committed to, um, to hold in-person classes. Everybody is um, you know, prefers to do this in person if it's safe, but if it's not, then um, we will just have to resort to online teaching like we are right now. Um, the current rule um, is in effect until uh, the Easter break, so beginning of April, um, and then we'll see what happens after that. Um, in, in the region currently, there is a third uh, wave going on, so um, we, we really don't know whether we whether we'll be able to go back to uh, teaching in person this academic year, but then what happens from September, um, we don't know. If it's possible, we we really want everyone to come to campus. Yeah, let me um, just say very quickly. So just emphasize this. So this whole program is planned uh, for a 
uh, offline, right, for in-person, as Andrea said. So this is the plan A for every uh, aspect of the university's activities. We just, we of course are forced to be in plan B like everyone, right, when you're doing online. So you'll try the best as possible to have uh, offline, of course, uh, but only as 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 if it's if it's uh, if, if if public health allows, right? This is what uh, Andrea said. So, so just to emphasize, this is the plan A. This is what we want to achieve, yeah. right? If we can. Exactly. And actually, in September, um, last September, we started um, hybrid teaching. So our undergraduate um, cohorts that started in September, those who could make it to, to Austria or who were in Austria already went and studied um, in the classroom on campus. And whoever could not make it to Vienna, which was about 25% of the class, uh, they were joining online from literally every continent. Um, we had people from, from all over the world. Um, we have three minutes left. So, and there are two more questions here. We're going to address this then and then um, send everybody to have lunch or um, afternoon tea. Um, so one of them is from Mira. She's asking how much of this data reaches the government of Hungary or any decision-making body um, in, in, in Hungary. Um, and then another question, I'll just take them just very quickly to see, decide who, who uh, responds to each one. Um, how have you formed the questions for the questionnaire? These groups like uh, the, the ones about um, who have conspiracy theories were formed before forming the questionnaire or after? Um, yes, okay, so, so far these two. Um, Julia, would you like to? Say something to the first one, maybe, or, 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 or I would take the second one, and I think yeah. Martin can take the Martin. Would you take the first one? Uh, you, I can take the first one, but please go on. Read the second one. Okay. Okay, so yes, absolutely. Actually, it is also connected to big data because uh, we were in collaboration uh, with a um, um, social net analyst company. And actually these items are all formulated based on the research which was made on social media uh, according to anti-vaccination uh, narratives. So yes, they were previously decided and the, yes, we had a theoretical concept in our mind, uh, but actually the concrete items which were attached to these kind of uh, theoretical concepts uh, were really got from the, so this is based um, on an empirical research. And that's how we formulated the questionnaire and then we analyzed the data, absolutely. And thank you for the question. It is, it is really important and good. Um, thank you, Yuli. Answering the first question. Um, so this data collection project is a part of a larger um, project, so to speak, which is uh, um, this um, epidemiological mathematics um, uh, task force, so to speak, of the Hungarian uh, government and one special ministry. So <clears throat> the data is not um, lending uh, to the government, but we are making uh, summaries and reports about the results we find, and these end up on the, on the table of the cabinet week by week. This is one. The other is that the data is fully anonymized. So it's uh, not even anonymized. It is not even collecting data about personal information. So uh, in that sense, um, the data of what we analyze, and especially the data what we give out of our hand, are just summary statistics and overall picture. It is not uh, a load for any centralized observation. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so thank you very much um, for being with us. Uh, we are, uh, as I wrote before, uh, we are re we recorded this event and we are going to um, uh, post it on um, uh, somewhere <laughs> and then share the link with you. Um, and also, I copied and pasted a link there in the in the chat box that. Um, that you can, um, where you can read more about the QSS program. We also uh, try to gather information about what you can do with a degree, what kind of um, uh, fields you can continue your graduate studies in, um, uh, you know, some typical, uh, what we think are typical um, workplaces or work settings that you could, where you could really make good use of a, a QSS degree, uh, but also who are the faculty. You can also see um, distribution of the, of the courses over the four years. 
um, uh, the specialization tracks, um, like pretty much everything that we thought was, was important for, and of course, application. One last remark is that we are still accepting our first application deadline for September has passed. It was on February 1st. Um, and the a second one is coming up on April 12th, where we welcome applications from students who will not need a study visa in, um, in Austria, which means basically students who are from either the, uh, uh, either hold an EU citizenship or from the European economic area. Uh, for everybody else, unfortunately, the immigration rules do not allow us to, um, to proceed with applications uh, for, for September, but we, we do welcome them for the, for the following academic year. So thank you for your attention and thank you to our presenters and Tiago and um, see you um, hopefully um, sometime at CEU.